got here, and I know I know what some of the answer is going to be, but I'm guessing there's some more to it. What is your favorite thing to study or learn, and why? So to learn, um, I would say, and this changes over time. Okay, so at this time, the thing to learn is how you use Tai Chi concepts off the mat in daily life. You know, so most of us, I remember my ninjutsu instructor said, you know, unless you're in law enforcement or in the military or live in a really bad neighborhood, you probably won't learn need to fight with what you learn in our classes. And that's certainly true of me. The chances, you know, I haven't gotten to a real fight and I'm 75 and the chances I will in the future are pretty small. Yeah. Okay. Awareness, so, awareness is the key is the skill that I find in self-defense that most often gets overlooked. And it's the number one skill. If you can do that well enough, you never end up in the, or you rarely, not never, you rarely end up in those circumstances because you yeah. saw it coming way down the road and went, I'm not going to go down there. Yeah. Right. There. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Tai Chi, learning Tai Chi skills that I can apply in everyday life in the living room when I'm with friends is like a, a super big deal. And that's at least as useful as, as fighting skills. And the examples of that are um, say yes to everything. So I don't remember where I heard it from you first. I probably I have heard whole, it from a, a long, other people. <laughs> an extra one to three hours on yeah. just that topic. So. But in the last few months, I've been able to really integrate that. And that becomes, um, it may not be my first response, but it's something I kind of, I'm if, if I'm struggling with an issue, normally I remember it after at least a couple of days. And it makes life much simpler when you say yes to everything. So if somebody says, let's go rob the bank, you're not saying yes to that. Oh, so, no, no, no. So, um, so give me an example of, like, explain a little further about how you're applying, say, yes to everything for life. Oh, like, um, my mother's uh, 102, and she wow. has, she's taken care of by 24-hour sitters Yeah, at a retirement home. And dealing with the sitters, there's a lot of frustration. OK, yeah. and so I was just, well, this is part of my life, having to take care of my mother, having to deal with the sitters and not trying to fight it, just sort of accepting that that's something. And and to some degree, accepting that I may not have a totally satisfactory answer. Yeah. You know, and there are going to be some loose ends that I'm not totally satisfied, but just accepting that and. That makes life easier. Yeah. It, it, for From a Christian standpoint, it's the poem, the serenity prayer, is it? The one about um, uh, accept the things. Oh, how'd it go? The, uh, it's it's uh, change the things you can. Yeah. Accept the things that you can't. And the and third wisdom is to know the difference. <laughs> to know the difference. And so that's really saying yes in, a, uh, in, that, in those ways. Right. Right. Yep. So, so that's, uh, let's see. And the other thing I was thinking, um, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was one thing that, that is something I can incorporate. And then, you know, uh, several of us did the level up uh, module and, um, and that you teach us how to access the observer. And, with that, there have been a couple of situations where I would be in a sticky situation, I would go to the observer, and then I was able to view the situation and the other person with compassion. Yeah. And then, so if you have a situation, you may be able to resolve it or not, but if you have compassion to the situation and the person, that makes your life easier than being angry. Yeah. So, so those are the kinds of things that are of huge value to me. Sure. Yeah. Um, yep. And then I know you like the combat stuff because you already talked about that a bit. 
And then you've got something here about personal safety. I don't remember. I think that was with the first, the first set of notes, and I didn't look at them again. <laughs> okay. yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure I knew what I was talking about at the time, but I don't know what I don't remember what I was referring That's to right. at this time. What is your favorite thing to teach, and why? So my favorite thing to teach, and I think you taught it to me, was what I call Tai Chi energy ball juggling. And this is a exercise for beginners. And it allows beginners like on day one to experience chi as something's tangible, as something that's real. And what it is, is you uh, make a Tai Chi ball and then you pass it from one hand to another. And then you give it to another person and they can feel it. And they can pass it back and forth to the hands and then you can give it to a third person and they can pass it back and then they can give it back to you and you can really feel that. And so that's, that's, I just, that's just total fun. And particularly with someone that hasn't felt energy before. Oh, yeah. So, you know, obviously among beginners, not everyone can sense it on day one. Sometimes it takes a few months, sometimes it takes years, but I mean, uh, I would say usually 70% of the people that I, I teach you to get it, and that's that's great fun. Cool. Um, what is your favorite thing to practice, and why? So again, that changes over time. Um, one one of the things I didn't mention is um, that I really enjoy, and I don't do it a lot, but I really enjoy it when I do it. Is to go into Shen. And then to do either form or ni gong when in Shen. Oh, yeah. And that has a totally different experience. Uh, the other thing is uh, in the level up, you taught us, a, well, you've mentioned it in other places. I remember you, I, I saw some notes for the people in the advanced Fa Kung course. And one of the exercises was to connect to God to feel it and to maintain it in a tangible way. Yeah. And so I, I that's my go-to meditation at this time. Yep. And, and that's, I, that I, I try to do that every day. Right. But that's, that's, that opens up some very interesting possibilities. Um, so that's very cool. And then another thing, again, that I learned in the level up was um, going, getting, uh, returning to Wuji. And when I do that, I get really, really relaxed. And then a lot of times that really helps me recharge if I'm kind of energy depleted, you know, I'm really dragging that. That's a, a really good exercise to get me recharged. So that, that's something I enjoy too. Cool. So talk about what you got out of the Fa Gong, the clear Tai Chi um, with the Fa Gong that helps and improves your other healing modality. Um, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, you already mentioned a little bit ago, Ting and then and some of that, so. Right, so what I would say is this. Um, Oh, okay. So one of the things is there was one thing you taught in the Falcon workshop that I found particularly helpful. And that is when you're doing Falcon, and you can do this if you're doing Reiki, is you imagine yourself being in the mid middle of a coliseum with 10,000 Qigong masters sending energy to you. And I found that made that really help intensify the experience. So that's one thing I learned. Um, I would say that when I, for, for me to, I can do as much with Reiki 
as I can with Falkland. There's there's no big advantage to me. But what I realize is I can do as much with Reiki as I can with Falkland. But a number of people in your organization, I believe Carly on Matt and Art, and certainly you can do a lot more with Falcone than I can do with Reiki. And a lot of it has to do with developing Ting. And when you really work on that, then you start seeing energy and then you can do things at a distance. And those are all things that are not part of my skill set at all. So if I were if if yeah. I were in a position that, you know, I if I was in a position where I wanted really to to expand my healing skills, I would pursue the advanced Falcon. Yeah. That's that's um, no question about that. Yeah. I would say that the last three years being mostly quarantine has been, you know, the way you're isolated has been the what's really held that off. That if you were interacting with people a lot more, especially in that way, I think you'd see that the skills would have continually yeah. improved and increased. Right. Uh, like that. So yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. And you put something about medical intuitive. Oh, yeah. So I think that's, I think what develops after you've done the workshop several times, and I think uh, is that you start to be able to see people's energy. I, that, I mean, Harry talks about that, and uh, and uh, Matt have talked about that, and it wouldn't surprise me if Carly can do it, and she may tell you about it, or she may not. Yeah, it depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sure you can, but when you can see people's energy and figure out what's going on in their bodies, just seeing their energy from across the room, that's what that's what most people in other metaphysical groups would call a medical intuitive. Okay. And so I think basically a lot of people, if they pursue uh, Falkland with you, will develop those skills. It, it, it takes time. I mean, usually you're talking about people taking the level one several times and and i imagine taking the advanced uh workshop several times too yeah, yeah. so there's a there's intensive training but it's just available and there's yeah. a pathway to do it and that's that's totally cool and i you know I, I i i wish that that were my life allowed me to pursue that it will again <laughs> uh, um what are the top three most memorable Tai Chi moments in your life, either seen or done or felt or experienced? Oh, yeah. So let me see. I wrote that down and it's not coming to mind. So these are sort of a little mundane and they're 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 not like the kinds of things you were talking about with Uncle Bill. But for me, they were memorable. Yeah. And And I don't have more memorable moments with you because I haven't gone to a lot of workshops. Uh, so, you know, so most of our contact has been over Zoom. But one of the memorable moments, and it was just an early on thing, is I was I was in Levittown, in the basement in Levittown, taking classes from William C.C. C. Chen. And somehow it came up and I said, oh, how do I feel, Chi? And so he just had me stand there. And then he he moved his hand about that fast his forearm and he hit me on the side of the arm yeah. with his forearm okay. and it felt it felt like I had been running and ran into a wall Yeah. and for like a half an hour the whole half side of my body was numb yeah. the other side of my body felt fine so that was like oh there is something to this oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, so that, that certainly got my attention um The second memorable one, um, the second one was something I mentioned before, just the Tai Chi skills making life easier. You know, you know having access to the observer and saying yes to everything. Yeah. And then the third one was, was something, um, in Columbus, I've met a couple of people that can see energy. And there's one woman that is probably the strongest in it. And I invite her to, to visit my class. And so when I would demonstrate when I would demonstrate 
my class would demonstrate the Tai Chi forms that we knew. So we we did a little bit of Wu, we did some Sun style, and we did Zhang style. And what she said was that the energy that was projected was different for each of the systems. And she could see the difference. And that was one part. The second part was if I, I would stand there and I would um, think of the different Reiki kanji, and again, she, she could see the difference in the energy when I focused on one kanji versus another. She could see a difference in the energy I projected when I just had the thought of one system of Tai Chi versus another system. And, and also ninjutsu had something different. And then what was really interesting is I would think of Bagua and Shingi, and she, again, she would see the changes in the energy. But at that time, I hadn't trained with either of them. So how I could connect to the energy and she would see it when I hadn't studied them is, uh, is like, <laughs> I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway. What is your two, current two to five year goal regarding Tai Chi? And I know it has more to do with like programs that you're working on and that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So, so for me, the the Lee module is coming up, and and uh, Jim is going to tell us when we start. <laughs> and uh, I've started on the uh, fighting applications workshop, studying that. And the other thing I really want to do is I I, I really want to study the uh, January workshop material on the hard style. That that's. Again, something I'm really looking forward to. Cool. Yep. And then we've got on the other one we've got online there is the uh, 10 apps, 10, 10, 10 applications. And a lot of them I've got as many as a good 25 different applications on there where it's just real simple and straight to it um, like that. And what I found is that when people are doing that, um, that once they get through about the first three or four of the moves doing that, Yes, um, or parts of moves that their whole understanding on the martial part seems to take a pretty big jump for it fairly. Quickly. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, thank so, you for letting I that's something. Um, thank you for letting me know about that. Yep. Chris. Yep. Um, okay. So what about clear Tai Chi is the most appealing to you? Uh, the fact that there's the combat and the healing, both, and the spiritual. So, and the fact that you have the higher level skills and you're willing to teach them. And, my, and the fact my language is English. <laughs> Go ahead. And, yeah. And, you know, and I can, I can ask questions and get answers. And that's very cool from people uh and and actually the <laughs> i mean the fact that uh english is your first language is good because a lot of tai chi you know famous tai chi instructors basically uh chinese is the first language and sometimes that's a barrier and so you know not to have do you have to deal with that is another plus i've had to deal with that a lot of my own studies but <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Fortunately, fortunately, I'm creative, and so I would ask my teachers, "Well, is that like if I did this?" And they would be like, "Yeah, that is an application." <laughs> Here, I hadn't thought about it that way, but you know, but uh, sure. And yep. Yeah. The uh, so why is this the path for you to achieve your goals? I, I get it because it has it has all those aspects, mm -hmm. and you know again to do something that I think would please my father is just something that feels good. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on that. 
Excellent. Um, anybody else got you know, on the call here? Got any questions for him at all? If so now is the time. Now is your chance. Yeah. Go ahead. Everybody's got hands up. Uh, Jim. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, with you, you said when you were um, doing your Reiki before you were doing the Fagung that you would use energy to uh, help your patients. Yeah. How would you how would you replenish your energy, or do you tap into energy? Because I know when Sifu teaches us the Fagung, it's like never use your own energy. Yeah, no, that's the same. That's that's the same in Reiki. That's the same. Okay. You're, you're a conduit for universal energy. Okay. So okay. one of the differences is in Tai Chi, we we have access to our own energy, to universal energy, and to earth energy. In Reiki, it's basically just your conduit for the universal energy. And you're not supposed to get your own energy involved at all. And that's... Um, the same as in the fog um, for us, is that you're not using yours, you're using that heaven and earth connection. Right. But there are some Qigong systems where they really build their Qi inside them and then and then use uh, their own energy. And some a lot of people get into trouble with that. So that's... Um, one of the stories, and, and the history of Reiki is, is a little bit convoluted, but one of the stories was that uh, Isui actually was a, had a, did a Japanese form of um, a Fakung, and he was looking for a way to not to deplete his own energy, and it was in the pursuit of that that he discovered Reiki. There are a lot of different stories, and whether that's a partially true story or a fabrication, I have no idea. But at least that was one of the stories about the motivation for Sui to eventually develop Reiki. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Cool. Other other folks, Ty. If I miss you, by the way, it's just because I'm not. If you're holding your hand up, it's because I'm not seeing you. So, like, you might have to flag me a little bit. <laughs> okay. Right. Now, uh, my question also goes back to Reiki. I think you answered it, but I'm not sure. I understand that if you're doing Reiki and you want to improve as a healer, you should be become involved with Fogang, correct? That there. I have not heard that. Are there additional skills that you get from Fogang? That you don't get in Reiki is, is hold on I, a second. My understanding. So, so, so the first thing is uh, the business about not mixing Reiki and Falcon. Mm -hmm. So that is not the, my major instructor. Um, is William Rand. So he's the head of the International Center for Reiki Training. So I'm, uh, you know, and I and he has he writes a lot and he has a a. Uh, which we call it a magazine that so he, he's constantly publishing and he has never talked about not mixing. And my guess is he wouldn't have a problem. He's open minded. I, I would wonder about the, the not mixing was being more of a political dog thing. I don't know, but I, I haven't seen a problem with it. And that hasn't been part of my training with any of my instructors. The, the quest, the bit, but the question is, is in as I was taught Reiki. And what I have seen in Reiki is uh, they they don't work nearly as hard at developing ting sensitivity. They don't feel what's going on as much as they just mm -hmm. try to address it direct without knowing, without sensing it. Right. So you you do a little bit of it, but but there's the the sophistication of ting in Falcon is way more than what it is in Reiki. So with Reiki training, I I can, if, if someone tells me, oh, my problem is the front side of my body or the back side of my body, I can, I can pinpoint, I can find that. But there are lots of very subtle things that, that occur in internal push hands and in Fa Kung, that's, this tinging is much more sophisticated than anything I've learned in Reiki. Uh, I Reiki has evolved since I was actively involved in 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 training. So there may be people that can do more than I was than I'm aware of. But in my experience, uh, the the Ting training 
in in Falkland what really exceeds Reiki, and that's a big part of its power and, and the ability they can get more results. In my that that would be my opinion. Does that answer your question? More or less. Uh, did you want to rephrase it? Is it is there a part well, that? Well, I had understood what that ting was something that was more sophisticated in Fagan. Is there any aspect of Reiki that is more sophisticated than what we do in Fagan? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. That and, answers and it my might, question. It might be, I, you know, in a couple of days, I might think of something, but I, I, I don't see that. Well, we email back and forth, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, have yeah. my email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so in, in, in Reiki, we, we do something like what Harry has done, where, uh, and it's, yeah, yeah that's, uh, thank you for bringing that up. So there's a thing called um, what I call Star Trek, Star Trek Reiki, and 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 distant healing and Reiki is, is an integral part of it. And normally, what you do is you imagine a surrogate and you send energy to the surrogate, and it goes over distance. And it's it's a non-local phenomenon. And um, one of the other things you can do is you can bring the other person's energy to you. And then you can work on it as if they're physically in front of you. And there's certain advantages to that. And that's something that was kind of introduced to me by one of my level one Reiki. He's just a really brilliant guy and he just figured it out himself. But and that's very cool. And it's something that that Harry and Matt do. Um, uh, and it, it, there's a little bit of a difference. So um when when I do it, I try to make the person small so I can move them around to get to different parts of the body. And when Matt does it, he makes the body big so he can look. That's how I do it. He gets it. a better I view of, of, of yeah, yeah. yeah, like if he wants to go inside, he gets a better view of what's on inside because he makes it big. And that's the method that's taught in the programs is how to basically bring their energy and then go inside of it like that. So that that way you can really yeah do that. And so... <laughs> The other way where you're outside of it and manipulating around, that's kind of taught there in level one with a couple of different exercises. Um, but then, and then there's a little bit added to that or revisited later on more and then more advanced. But I'm really a fan of being able to go inside because um, when you make them big like that, you really get extra specific about what you're working on because it's big. <clears throat> yeah. And, and so, that's a prime example of the, the difference in the sophistication of it, I would say. Okay. And the potential. Yeah. So I, you know, and obviously I, I think what, what Steve was talking about really uh, expands the potential for, for benefits, for, for beneficial effect. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So it's not to slam Reiki. Reiki is a big part of my body. It's a big part of the how I ended up in Tai Chi. But you know, I I, I think it has limits, and and uh, I just and I wish I just wish I could get further along in Falco. And I met a lot of people that had Reiki skills. Most of them, um, when I'm checking them with like what we do, I'm like, it feels like you're missing things. And I had never put my finger on what it, like exactly what they were missing. And now I know it's that they're missing yeah. that sensitivity training. And like there's because you've seen a certain level of sensitivity training with me, but that continues all the way through. Yeah. So you've seen it at a level, but there's much more levels of that. And so if they're missing that, that's going to make a giant difference pretty quick too. you know, the, the, something no, it's going to be noticeable like it's been. To me. So within the Reiki tradition, there is a thing called biosyn scanning, which is there. And I don't think people really use it. To its potential, but that's the closest thing that we have in Reiki to to Ting. Yeah, yeah. and it's not, and it's it, it's it's pretty fundamental, and you know, it's not well developed. Yeah, no, I get it, Jim. 
Yeah, I'm uh, also thinking about it since you have been doing Reiki and studying Reiki so long and some Fagong. What sort of studies have you made in terms of traditional Chinese medicine with meridian work, acupuncture, acupressure, and those things? Uh, again, he's asking what, if you studied any acupuncture or or anything about the meridians or um, that. Kind well, of uh, so I, I've been I really enjoyed uh, the, that whole part of it. And um, there's one book on on uh, acupuncture meridians called "The Essential Anatomy for Healing and Martial Arts." Essential Anatomy for Healing and Martial Arts, and it's really good because it has good diagrams, and they're accurate. And it's and it's something that I've I, I use a lot. Um, I I'm not trained in that. So one of the things is uh, I can find I can find any meridian by feel, and I can find the points by feel. And a lot of a lot of acupuncturists find points by looking for landmarks, <coughs> and not by feel. So so I can do that, but I'm not trained in acupuncture. Now, when you say you can feel them. Is this because of your Reiki training or your Fagong and Tai Chi training? I I developed it before I started Fagong, if I remember it right. So it's just a question. You go over the area and then you feel a tug. And then you move up and down and then you, you move up and down that area. And then you, you get a point, it's stronger. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, so it's simple, but it's... Is it's, it always a it's tug a, or sometimes it's a push? Say again. Is it always a tug, a pull, or is sometimes it's a push? Normally, I feel it as a pull. As a pull, okay, interesting. And I, I normally I feel it. I feel it in my hand to some degree, and also I feel it in the third eye. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so you know, I'm a kind of like an analytic person. I'm not like a deep feeling person. So, yeah. so Sheila might feel it in her heart center, but I feel it up in my head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, anybody else? Any questions? Mark, you looked like you were, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting patiently. I want to see if someone else would ask some of the questions. So real quick, before, we, before I ask my question now, uh, if you ever come to a workshop, Phil, that I'm at, you yeah. have to sit by me so I can, add, I want to hear your stories, your personal stories about these, these guys, because I have their books. Uh, oh, know, yeah. A lot of that's from before I was born. Right. And I, you know, I was always fascinated with that stuff. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So yeah, if you I, hopefully you know we can line up at a workshop and at lunch. Okay. Yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah. Feel free to talk my ears off, man. I'd be so, really. Yeah. So what he's asking <laughs> is, does, do you have any stories about any of the particular masters or teachers yeah. there that, that you didn't share today that that you think people would find particularly interesting? Yeah, so, do you have one, a personal story, or? So though, though I, I guess I'll mention one for this is this is kind of cool. So, so my claim to fame in martial arts is is one of them is I learned the long form in four days. So that's that's my first claim to fame. The second one is I mentioned in one of, and I'm mentioned in one of um, Robert Smith's book, and he doesn't talk about this great martial artist. He just says. He mentions a Chinese American doctor who had called him to tell him about the medical situation of his friend Don Drager. So that's in a book. Okay. <laughs> so that's an honorable mention. It certainly yeah. doesn't. It does. It doesn't suggest I have any skill or anything. It's just I pro I provided some, some information. But one of the things is that Don Drager uh, was died from. Um, I think they call it a, an argentifin tumor of the colon, and I don't remember which part. And he thinks it was because he was poisoned in Indonesia. Mm. And he he that's what he told me. The reason that he got it was because he was poisoned. And he was. And 
And anyway, and so I had I had just mentioned that to Robert Smith when I saw him many years later. And Robert Smith thought said that, oh, Don Draker makes up all kinds of stories. But then I talked to Sifu yesterday or the day before, and he said no, that Don Draker had uh, basically Don Draeger what has an instructor level in about 17 different Japanese martial arts, which well, is phenomenal. Arts, not all of them are Japanese even. Say again? Not all of them are Japanese even. So if, so if he's, he got 17 in Japanese arts and then he's, he's also an instructor level in other martial arts, or has he just got like a high level in about 17 martial arts? Because some of those aren't Japanese. Some of the arts that he knew were not Japanese arts. Okay, so right so my understanding of it was 17 japanese arts but okay. i'm not okay. sure i don't know that that's true it no, was more than one japanese and then he's also an instructor level master master maybe in some of them too for some other martial arts um as well right and anyway, that i don't know but one of the things is a lot of the japanese instructors resented him because he would go to conferences and they would have a top perform you know a top person in their system demonstrating something and he would get he would be the person to demonstrate this school and that school and the next school and the next school and the Japanese really resented that you know because he was so skillful in so many different things and most of them just did one or two. So he, there were a lot of Japanese that resented him because of that. Yeah. And then what Sifu, well, why don't you tell us the story so he, about so he wrote Indonesia? A book called Weapons and Fighting Arts of, of Indonesia. And what he did was he went and traveled the country, uh, the, the island, went throughout a whole bunch of the different islands and like through the whole region for Indonesia and Malaysia. And with the Pinchok Sea Lot, Kuntal Sea Lot, Baris Sea Lot, the, the arts from those islands and, and, and like a bunch of different islands. Like there's there's like a thousand, uh, 10,000 different islands. It's a lot. And then he went to a whole bunch. And he went from one master to another and like, okay, what are you guys special in? And how does your style work? And what do you do? And how do you do it? And they told him, and these people are very, very secretive. And when they told him, they also did stuff where it's like, okay, you are our student now. And he either misunderstood that or he kind of ignored it. <laughs> and then wrote his book. And his book had all these different teachers from all these different areas and, and what they specialized in and different stuff that he experienced and saw and all that stuff. And then after he wrote the book and it came out, he went back. Well, they had all got copies of his book. And most of them were very, very, very unhappy. That's the nicest way I can put that. And they weren't unhappy because they were unhappy because he put what he put about them, not because they didn't like what he put about them in terms of him putting something wrong. It's that they didn't realize they had shown him that much and weren't trying to didn't, and normally wouldn't. And the bigger upset was, is that they thought, OK, he's studying with us. And really what he did was he did this survey of like, I don't know, hundreds of instructors in this book. Right. And, and styles and all of that. And so they felt very betrayed. And unfortunately, Indonesia, Indonesian martial arts, their specialty, they're like one of their top, they've got a number of things they specialize in, but one of those things they specialize in is poison and how to make poison and how to put poison on things, even, even from your hand or whatever. Also, most of the real blades from there, they're infused with different kinds of poison. And the reason that it's different kinds of poison, because it was all the same poison, then whoever got cut with that, injured with that, stabbed with that, injected with that, they could go get an antidote. But when you don't know what the poison is, and it's a mixture of poisons or a specific mixture of poisons, you don't account for everything well, or you, or you miss some, and then, of course, it's poison, so it kills you. And they specialize in this. This is something that's very well known. There's there's video documentary of this stuff too. There's a guy making, I want to say this is a ring of fire, maybe. There's a guy who's got a big bat and he's doing stuff and he's putting it, he's showing, he's taking some things and putting poisons in there. He ain't showing you all of them. He's not showing you all of them. He's showing you some of them. 
And then he's using that to fold into this blade so that the blade itself is infused with the poison to give you an example of this. And then one of the stories that I had heard early on about Indonesia and Malaysia was that a guy came to a village that was not from the village and he was a cook, a chef, and he opened up a restaurant. And within the next two, three, four, five years, all of the Silat masters in the village died. Like his restaurant was very popular. They all died, right? And then he popped out after they were all gone and said, well, I'm a Silat master. And he opened up his school and started teaching. He poisoned them all. And that was, you know, and then there's other stories like this. So it's very common and fully well understood by the people who were there. It's just not so well understood by people who aren't there. Well, Drager covered the whole country. He was there for some period of time and then he went back and they all invited him to eat. Nice meals and whatnot. <laughs> So this, the, the, what I've heard from people that are more prolific, but also from the culture is they poison them. Simple, wow. do, you, do, you, do you know the name of the book that uh, Drake is book on Indonesian? Yeah, it's Weapons it's... and Fighting Arts of Indonesia. Oh, is it still in print? Last time I checked, no, it's been a while. Okay. I, I wasn't aware of that. I, I'd like to get that. Yeah. Yeah. Phil, the last I, um, I purchased a copy a few years ago on Amazon, and it was not in print, but it was available at surprisingly reasonable prices. Um, but if it was a few years ago, it's hard telling now. It may be available in print again. It might be that it's not, but you can get one, but it's going to be pricey. It just depends on the circ I don't know what the circumstances are. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. Yep. Anyways, so yeah, the the likelihood is that they poisoned him and they gave him a poison that would cause him an issue of some kind that then turned into, you know, it's basically thinking about it this way, different kinds of toxins can create cancer. Is that correct? Yeah. So the one that I'm, a, the one, the, the one thing that I'm aware of that can cause cancer, and I don't know if it would, if it would be this type of cancer, but, um, Let's see. It's, it's arsenic. Yep. So sometimes you get arsenic in well water, and then you get communities that have a high incidence of certain types of cancer. Yep. Well, so glyph that's glyph glyphosate or whatever, however you pronounce it. Say again. Glyph glyphosate. That's the one the lawyers are always on the TV. If you've had glyphosate, which is I can't think oh. of the All right, so it wouldn't surprise me if arsenic also would cause crazy. blood disorders. Yeah, that wouldn't that like wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. So. Um, yep, and other things like that. So it's yeah. Yep. Um, cool. Okay. So, so mercury, mercury can cause also cause a lot of problems. Yep. But actually, I, I had a professor at, at medical school who died. She was. I, I believe she was in a, an Italian hotel and somehow there was mercury in the environment and ultimately that killed her. You know, what's horrifying about that is when I was a kid in grade school, we played with mercury as part of our class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, people would break thermometers and play with the mercury. Quicksilver. Yeah, quicksilver. Yeah. And now, of course, but anyway, but <laughs> to say so, if you eat too much fish and you can start telling the temperature just by then it's time to stop eating fish. Really? Yeah. If you can tell the temperature, oh, because of the thermometer, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. But but I don't know if it causes but, cancer, but it can certainly make you sick. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so yeah, I'm, I I would I would say the odds are super high that that he was at, that Drager was active about that. Yeah. So it's funny, but, but Smith didn't believe him. <laughs> Smith and was the mostly other... familiar with Chinese culture, and in Chinese culture, it's not that you couldn't get poisoned, but it would be considered really dirty. Yeah, okay. To do that to somebody versus in Indonesian for the for the for the art there, I can't speak for the people so much. I think that's a little different, but for the art of Silat, it very much is about subterfuge and, oh, okay. and, and sneakiness and you know, one of the sayings in the culture is if you've got an enemy, hand him a book. When he looks at the book, you stab him. 
And yeah. so it's like, what's the deal there? Well, they tricked him into looking at the book instead of looking at the knife that was coming. You know, and and then that was that's kind of like the higher thought process on the guard. It's how slick can you be, you know, in that way. Anyways, you get the idea. And so same thing with the restaurant story, the story about the restaurant owner. You know, he was slick, he killed all the masters. He didn't have to do anything, he didn't have to fight for it. Yeah. So what one other story and it, uh, this is this is the last story I can think of is that that Smith said Smith said and I don't know if it's true and and I don't know if his his opinion changed over time but Smith said that Drager didn't understand energy. So Smith know. studied Smith studied you know a lot of Chinese systems of where energy was a big part of it yep. and and a lot of what what um, Drager did, he did a lot of judo and he did a lot of sword work. And so Smith felt that, that Drager really didn't understand, uh, you know, internal energy. So I'm sure he got some exposure to it, but that's different than being a, a skilled practitioner. Yeah. All right. yeah. 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 I wouldn't doubt that. Yep. All right. Um, and then Robert Smith's stories would be interesting too. Anything there for, for that? Yeah. All right. Um, more next time because we're, we're kind of out of time today. The uh, so if you're interested in the kind of things we've been talking about for clear tai chi, if you're wanting to fog gong, you'll need to look at our like look at our fog gong. Is it foggung.com or f a k u n g dot com or something else? Actually, what I'm going to suggest is that um, everybody uh, who's interested in pretty much any of the things we talk about, go to clearmartialarts.com because we have all that material available there um, on the on the store page. And we've tried to make it pretty easy to like search for things and and, uh, you know, sift through things by kind of relevant subject and all that stuff. So really anything, including the fog on um and including and like, sheet level one dvds or online instruction including the module there that's for the app the tenant the applications yep. of tai chi um and where each move has um we'll put at least a minimum of 10 on there and probably put closer to 20 to 30 on each move or each part of a you know very specific like transitional moves too that kind of a thing. And then we go all the way through our 13 move set. And then we're adding on the ones now that um, not all of them, but a bunch of the ones from the 48 as well. And by the time you get to working that, you'll start to see through that lens of looking at it and be able to really take any Tai Chi move and start to get a better sense of a lot of what's going on in the moves and mm -hmm. how, to, how to apply it and, and applications that are there and readily available in that time. And I've seen Sifu Clear do that live, by the way. He was shown a Tai Chi move that had a kind of funky <laughs> thing going on there um, that that he hadn't seen that way before, and yet still was able to rattle off 10 applications like off the top of his head uh, for that specific for that move. movement. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it does, it does change the way you see Tai Chi. It changes the way you see almost any martial art you're looking at. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's just a wonderful program for those who are interested in the combat side of Tai Chi. Um, and that, and like I say, you know, everything that we've talked about here is available on clearmartialarts.com. Um, and you can choose between online access or DVDs. And if you want to do live, we've got live programs, uh, on the average of every couple months, we've got something. And then in June, that clear, if you're like, what's the first one I should come to? And it's like, you're going to come to a lot and come to the next one that's coming up. If you're like, I'm going to pick one for the year to start, try to get some exposure and, and uh, get the meat and get a lot of different uh, topics talked about and covered and taught on and meet a bunch of our folks there, then that's that June event. Um, each year, it's the first week, full weekend in June, and that's at TaiChiGathering.com. Lots of fun, lots of good people, good times, good food, uh, and fun. So, all right. so one, one thing I would like to mention that, that I didn't realize until probably a, a couple of, at least a year after I studied it, was the level one uh, course teaches doing the form, and then it teaches doing the form with sort of different expressions, doing with wave and energy and this and that. And... When I went through it, I, I I studied it, but it was it didn't 
I, I really didn't engage me. And then it was only later that I realized doing it in different ways was the foundation training for learning the jinns. Yes. Well, it was not an accident. It wasn't just, oh, this is for entertaining. This is foundation training for the jinns, which are at a higher level. And if you get where you're getting to get some of this going on externally and internally, then when you get to the jinns, they'll, you know, you'll have some background. In it. So there's there's some real value in that that I didn't get it when I was until yeah. afterward. <laughs> there's some G level stuff in there. There's some E level stuff in there. There's some Jing level stuff in there, Jin. Uh, and then there's um, some things that lend itself to the higher, you know, the higher level stuff. Even though it's it is beginner, so it's it's doing this in a way. At the same time, it's approaching it very simply and directly and e fairly easily to consume. Mm -hmm where you could overlook it if you didn't know, or once you go further along and you're going, I'm having a little trouble here and look back at level one. Oh, that's where this <laughs> comes from. Okay. <laughs> Got to disconnect it that way to help you in your in your progress there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And again, that's through martial arts.com. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say there there is a method to the madness. Yes. <laughs> but is there a madness to the method? Well, <laughs> some inquiring minds say yes. Eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, guys, uh, we, you can stay on if you want after we're done there for any questions, comments, conversation, whatever. And then uh, we'll, um, we'll end our recording for today. And thank you, everybody, for participating. And thank you, Phil, for being such a good sport about answering all the questions. And um, more next time.